Buenos dias. I am very honored to be here today in Guatemala because there are people in this country who have meant a lot to me and taught me much. And it is a very great honor for me to be here. What I want to tell you about is um, a story today about my path to becoming a teacher. Um, like many people, I never really knew what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I kept going to school and going to college. And I found myself in 1996 actually in a, in a class in constitutional law at the University of Texas. Constitutional law can be very boring. <laughs> and one of the things I became very interested in was the Supreme Court. And in reading the briefs and everything from the court, they were very boring. And so I looked around to try to find other things, and what I found was that the Supreme Court in the, in the United States had begun audio taping their recordings in 1955. And so they taped all of the proceedings and everything like that, and they had set in the National Archives until 1993, when a professor decided to do something very disruptive. He put them on the web. So this was one of the first uses of streaming audio on the web. And I'm going to play a little bit of it here for you, because while it too can be very boring, I get to listen to it. And that made an enormous amount of difference to me because it made the people come alive. W. Bush and Richard Cheney versus Albert Gore et al. Uh, before we begin the arguments, the court wishes to commend all of the parties to this case on their exemplary briefing under very trying circumstances. We greatly appreciate it. They did, uh, under no circumstance. Very trying circumstances. That was probably the understatement of the century. Very, very early in the century. Because what we ended up with in the United States was an extremely, extremely, extremely close election. And we had some troubles in Florida and this and that, but the, the bottom line that I learned from that is the Supreme Court decided who our president was gonna be. So if you want the most powerful job in your country, sit on the court, because that's where the real power is. But I, I actually learned something else in that. And what I learned in that was something that really changed my path as an educator. And I learned that there was power with audio and other media with instant access that the web gave. And you have to remember that this was very early on in this. And with audio anyway, it would actually work. Uh, a few of you are old enough to remember telephone modems, chee 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 chee, little noises and everything, very slow in the page, just kind of loads and loads and loads. Well. That was um, a time when the audio would actually work pretty well from that. So what I did was the best place I found that I could work and use these kind of technologies because it wasn't in government or political science. They hadn't, didn't think anything at all about it. It was actually in a school of library and information science. So I actually ended up going to the graduate school that my mother went to who was a uh, middle school librarian for 30 years and had a great impact on me. And so one of the things um, I did when I got there is I began learning how to create audio on the web. And very quickly after that, began to create video as well. And you have to remember that this is in 1998, okay? This is eight years before YouTube was ever even on the planet. So, but you can see the little motions and the little this, and the way I did that was I, I used this to show students how to do things on the computer. So I didn't have to do it over and over and over again. They go to the computers and they watch it like that. So that was a very interesting um, thing for me to learn. Type Lexus period GSLIS ah, period. One of my students U from nineteen ninety eight. The other thing that happened when I was in the graduate school of library and information science is I met a woman uh, who was a doctoral student there who was from Guatemala. 
And she was teaching a class there called Information in Cyberspace. It was teaching undergraduates at the university how to use this thing called the internet and the web because they knew nothing. And so she was doing this in a classroom, but our classroom was very small and the students all wanted to learn and wanted to learn and wanted to learn. And we, had, we didn't have the room for them or the computers. And so I went to her and I said, well, why don't we put this online? You know, using some of these technologies. So we started working together and, and looking to see what technologies were out there and, and working with those. And there wasn't much at the time. There was a markup language called Synchronized Multimedia Integration Language, SMILE, where you could put audio, you could put text and video together so you could do subtitles and stuff. So that was kind of neat, but all of it was very hard to use. And Greta didn't like that. And so she would go and then like most marriages, when you're at your work, you complain a little bit. When you really complain is when you go home. And that's when your spouse hears all of the problems, okay? But Greta's spouse happened to be a very talented computer scientist and programmer, and he fought back. And he fought back by writing software. And we still use the software today. Um, so what is disruptive? I can hear my mother's voice right now. Get the dictionary and look up the word. Okay. So I did that. To interrupt the normal course of something. Well, what we were trying to do was to interrupt the normal course of education. Let's do something different here. And one of the things that we really, that both of us wanted to do was to use real archival and historical materials, audio and video materials, original source materials, with real students in real classes. We also were very interested in dealing with materials where the preservation of the original item is often impossible. These are often magnetic tapes or videotapes or something like that. And what we found over time is that what everybody claimed was a miracle at the time turned out to be something that fell apart and rotted away. And so much of our cultural heritage is on materials that do not last. And this is a huge problem in our profession and for the world in general. The other thing um, that gave us though is because if these materials were, were rotting away anyway, what do you have to lose by letting the students work with them? Nothing. Um, the other thing we, that was very important that we wanted to do is to ensure that the students got credit for their work. Because in the age of Google, your name can be found. And we're not paying you. As a matter of fact, you're paying for the privilege of working for us. And the least we can do is to make sure that you get credit for your work. So it was very important for the students' names to be on there as well. Okay. So what is rich media? For what we started with, which was just text, some with audio and video, has now become something to where we can take audio, video, images, text, geographic information, and all kinds of other things. And we can organize it like a book. It has a table of contents and an index. As a matter of fact, it can have indices. It can have lots of different indexes to go into it. It's nonlinear like a book. You can flip to wherever you want to go. You can go to what point that you need. But the most important thing is it's searchable. And that's very powerful. The other thing is it can be modified by the user because one size does not fit all. Everybody has different ways of doing things. And it allows you to do that. The other thing that's very important about it that I've learned with my students is it can be shared, annotated, easily created, easily corrected via the web. And that makes it a very um, powerful tool to use. So that's rich media. Now, for the most important question. This is a hard one. What does Harry Truman and Taylor Swift have in common? Harry Truman is one of my favorite presidents, and he had a lot of really excellent quotes. And two of them are two that are, are dear to me that I remember all the time because I need to. The first one is, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. And the other one is, the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. 
okay? Taylor Swift happens to be one of my daughter's favorite people. And Taylor Swift has a line in a song now that goes, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> Something to think about. Okay. So what, what I'm fixing to show you here, and hopefully all the technology will work, is made possible by my students. None of this would be possible without them because I simply don't have the time and energy to do all this. And there's nothing more gratifying than having an idea, giving it to a student, and watching it explode. Nothing. So what we have here is, is uh, a project that Greta and I started with um, back in uh, many years ago. In The only way you could record television was by kinescope. So you would record it off of the TV monitors onto film. And so we found a series of films that was done by Mike Wallace in the 50s. I have no idea whether he has grown. I would say that he was a very intelligent person and that he had uh, a very clear idea of what he wanted and had um, conducted himself wisely to achieve the ends he desires. That was Eleanor Roosevelt describing Richard Nixon. Had we only listened. Next is a, is a very interesting project that um, we worked on with eight classes over a period of three or four years, and it's about an endangered species in Texas, environmentalists, people concerned about the environment. You don't hear a lot about that in Texas. Um, and what was interesting about this is after a while, we actually won an award for this for the most innovative archive on the web. It was completely unexpected. But it is a very innovative archive in a lot of ways. It's also very large. This is two, three, four hundred hours of audio and video content that's searchable. And so what I'm going to do right, right now is I'm going to search across all that content for Guatemala and see what I find. And one of the, uh, this is one of the things that you really don't know as you build these, is what happens when you can search not within a piece of media, but across. And so now these results are back from Guatemala and I can go here and see what this person had to say. And the search term is pushed down into the software and I can go directly to the point that I want to get to. I'm to uh, uh, Guatemala and you see the Mayan uh, pyramids and all of that, you know, and nature has just simply taken that back over. I got to spend some time in the countryside of Guatemala and nature does take back over. It's amazing how things grow when it rains all the time. The next one that was, um, ah, there's one more there though. I have to show my favorite. As I was flying out of Houston down to Guatemala, um, the plane goes out over, um, Channel View, which is along the Houston Ship Channel there. And it's a, where the large petrochemical industry is and everything. And there's a, um, a town there called Channel View. So if I want to search across this for George Bush, I can go back and search across for George Bush and see what comes back. Um, so I go to this one here and I say, okay, what did this lady have to say about George Bush? Or what did these other people have to say about it? Well, when I go here, what I learn is what the citizens of Channel View have nicknamed him. Citizens, most citizens in Channel View refer to as Toxic George. Ah, there's his nickname, Toxic George. Okay, so I know that now. Um, so it's, you can find very interesting things in this archive. Um, another thing I flew over when I was coming down here was Spindletop. Spindletop is a very, very small town in Texas that uh, is not even a town anymore, but that's where um, the oil industry, the modern oil industry really began. There should be audio here. I was born over here at Weatherford. But I went to Beaumont in 91. Okay, that's 1891, okay. The people here at Spindletop in 1901 were recorded by University of Texas historians in the 1950s 
onto magnetic audio tape. And what we were able to do is digitize that and put it online so the students could hear it. And it's fascinating to watch the students when they hear somebody who's talking that was born in 1872. They talk kind of country, I'll tell you, that's for sure. Um, the other thing that's interesting here is we had a project uh, in the 1980s to do an index of this entire collection here. This is some two to 300 hours of interviews and stuff. And, and students went through and made a huge index of this on paper to, to work with the collection. We've taken that same index and reverse engineered it. And so every point in here, you can click on it and go to that exact word where it's mentioned in that archive, which is very powerful. Um, another one that came home to me to drive the power of it was the Texas Archive of the Moving Image done by a professor at UT who has, who's actually been to Guatemala to speak, um, Carolyn Frick. And this is a really neat project because I was walking across campus with her one day and she said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to Talco. She said, well, I have video of Talco. Well, Talco, Texas is right here. It's this little bitty spot right there. And what was really interesting is this is from 1936 and I went to show it to my grandmother and she said, look, that's your great grandfather <laughs> who had the bank then. So you never know what you're gonna see with Rich Media. Um, there are lots and lots of other examples, but what I wanna do is go to the one that I'm currently proudest of. This is a student that did something with the LBJ library and these are multiple, multiple indices of different things that have to do with it. We have everything that had to do with this incident was the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And this is where LBJ made the decision to escalate the Vietnam War. And there are many, 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 many resources here, top secret documents, communications from the field, communications from ships, all kinds of things. And one of the interesting things about this is, is we can actually also take a look at it here. It has now been joined by open aggression on the high seas against the United States of America. The determination of all Americans to carry out our full commitment to the people and to the government of South Vietnam will be redoubled by this outrage. Yet, our response? We don't know what people are going to do with that yet, but it's really cool. And I really like it too, if I did. Um, so these are two different platforms to do the same thing on right here. Um, I could go on and on and on, but Ted doesn't let you go on and on and on. So what I'm going to do here is, come, is stop with a wish and a challenge. Uh, I belong to an interesting generation of people. We're the last generation who could read an encyclopedia from A to Z. Okay, And I also belong to a generation that could actually look at every web page in the world for a very short time. Okay, Imagine reading all of Wikipedia. Imagine looking at all the pages on the web. Things have changed. Um, my wish is for every leader in every country across the world, to open their records to everyone, just like this Texan did. As he says, with the bark off, fair and open. My challenge is for our current president, when the time comes, to do the same. Because his records are digital, and they're very amazing. What I know today is that the sunshine of democracy is fueled by the unrestricted uncensored, open access to information. Rich media makes it sweeter. It's our responsibility to make it happen, but to also make it last. Thank you for letting me share.